So my topic is about true worship. And maybe you're thinking, what is worship? And I think in the church we kind of debate what worship is. We have these long discussions about what worship should look like or what, what exactly it is. And worship involves a lot of things. It involves coming to church to worship God on the Sabbath. It involves singing praises to God and speaking of him with the fruit of our lips. But is worship just limited to these things? And is it just limited to a specific place and a specific time? So I want to look at what the word worship means. Um, so if we go to the Greek um, word, meaning... Hopefully this is working. All right, I think that's working. Okay, uh, worship. So in Greek, the word is proskuneo. And that means to prostrate oneself in homage or reverence to worship. And basically, it's just showing an act of reverence towards God. But this reverence is not limited to what we do on the Sabbath. But rather, it encompasses every part of our lives. And the story I want to talk about that kind of explains this is the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. So Jesus meets this woman and he invites her to worship him as the Messiah. And throughout her story, we'll discover what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. So, yeah, we're going to read just probably the first part of this story. But when we look at this story, we'll see... Um, the first point, that worship is actually relational. And it's about having an authentic relationship with God. So we see in this story, um, yeah, that this woman meets Jesus and she, um, yeah, realizes who he is. And she realizes that she um, is desiring to have a relationship with him. And for that relationship to work well, it must be honest, authentic, and vulnerable. So we're going to read John chapter 4, verses 1 to 26. So if you'd like to open up your Bibles to John chapter 4, verses 1 to 26. All right, so if you'd like to read along with me. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw, water, uh, to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it, from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, 
and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So this is our story for this morning. And before I go into it a bit further, I wanted to talk about someone kind of off on the similar topic, but off. Um, So her name is Brene Brown, and she is an American professor and social worker. And she spent about two decades studying uh, courage, vulnerability, and shame and empathy. And she did a TED talk that was entitled The Power of Vulnerability. And she says the reason why our society is um, facing a lot of loneliness, um, obesity and addiction than ever before is because we as a society have numbed vulnerability. And that holds people back from being truly connected to each other. And she says that one way to overcome this relational disconnection is to live a wholehearted life. And she says you can do that by embracing vulnerability, to accept the fact that you are worthy of love and belonging, just as you are. And this advice, it really relates to the story in John chapter 4, where this Samaritan woman is fully known by God, yet she is fully loved as well. So when Jesus goes to meet her, it is the middle of the day, It's not a normal time to go get water from the well, and there's no one else around. She is going there alone. She's carrying her water pot, and she's hoping that she won't bump into anyone. She knows the life she's living is not ideal, and she's going there so that she can avoid talking to anyone else or being the talk of the town. But then, Jesus' disciples, they go into town and they go and buy food. And he stays there at the well. And he's waiting to meet this woman. And as she comes to the well, he begins to talk to her. And he asks her for a drink because he doesn't have anything to get water from the well. And as he's talking, he kind of turns it onto spiritual matters. And he says, well... I'm going to offer you this living water. And she becomes interested in receiving this living water. And she's trying to figure out, where can I find? Where can I find it? And then he's beginning to explain what this living water is all about. So he says in verse 14, that whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. And so he's saying that this water will spring up into Um, everlasting life. So he's talking about this um, spiritual reality. And just as he starts talking about this, he brings the conversation back, and he brings it back to the temporal reality, um, which is in verse 16 to 18. And we see here Jesus say to her, "Go, go call your husband. And maybe this woman is thinking, wait, I thought we were talking about living water. What does this have to do with my personal life? But this is a point that Jesus is trying to make. He's saying that her, sp- her spiritual life had everything to do with her personal life. And that worship includes who you are in relationship with. And if these relationships are trying to fill the place that only God can fill. So Jesus brings to light her personal life, 
and he's exposing what she thought she was trying to hide. But here is a moment of vulnerability for her. Jesus confronts her, but he doesn't condemn her. And if you think about being in a safe relationship, a person needs to be, um, or in that relationship, it should be vulnerable, it should be, a person should feel see, see, uh, feel seen? No, that doesn't make sense. Feel heard? <laughs> I'm getting tongue-tied. Um, they should be able to be vulnerable, heard, seen, and supported, and be completely themselves and not feel judged. But if a relationship is unsafe, then a person can't be themselves. They can't share what's on their mind, and they are kind of worried about being criticized or being judged. So here, Jesus is providing a safe place for this lady. He is open and honest with her. She is fully known to him, and yet she is fully loved. And it's in this space of vulnerability that Jesus provides a foundation for her to be transformed. We see in this story that her life and spirituality are connected. And that's what true worship is. It involves the life that we live. It connects spirituality to how we live. And that means we need to let Jesus into the deepest parts of our hearts, even the parts that we don't want him to see. When Jesus got personal with the woman at the well, she begins to try to change the subject. And she wants to kind of compartmentalize worship into a place or just about, it's all about religion. And she changes the subject as she's talking to him. <clears throat> and then she brings up this contentious issue about uh, a place to worship where the Jews and the Samaritans, they kind of have this conflict. And so she's trying to question Jesus about this contentious issue. But we see here that worship is not about a location, but it involves her personal life. And the way that she was living was preventing her from worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And we see here, it says that God is spirit in verse 24. <clears throat> and when God is spirit, that means he cannot be confined to a location. He's not restricted by um, a place. And the Bible says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And that's in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. So here we glorify God, not just through corporate worship and what we do on the Sabbath, but by living a life of worship. So we worship God by having an authentic relationship with him and letting him into every corner of our lives. And when we have this, when we have this relationship with God, we don't stay as we are, but we are transformed by him. So worship, it's not only relational, but it's also transformational. And we see with this woman that she leaves a life that she was living behind. She realized that Jesus could quench this thirst that she had with the living water. And in verse 28, it says that the woman then left her water pot. So she leaves it behind. And this symbolized her old life because she was trying to find value, love, and security in relationships that were outside of Christ rather than in Christ. But like the water pot, these relationships left her feeling empty and thirsting for more. And I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't be in relationship because God created us to be in relationship with each other through friendship and marriage. But it's not to find um, that fulfillment that only Christ can give through these things. So worshipping God is about having a fulfilling relationship with him. And she was trying to quench this thirst that she had. She was trying to fulfill a legitimate need, but in an illegitimate way. But she found that satisfaction and fulfillment in knowing Christ, and that's what changed her life. She left behind that water pot because Jesus quenched her spiritual thirst. 
So we see she's transformed as she leaves that life behind, and then she lives a life of being unashamed. After she met Jesus, she no longer wanted to hide anymore. She goes from drawing water at the well at noon where there's no one else around, and then she goes out and she goes into the city and proclaims Jesus to everyone there. And in verse 29, she's going out and she's telling everyone, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She doesn't care anymore what people think. And she didn't think about her reputation or, um, yeah, what people were thinking about her. All she cared about was what God thinks and that he fully knew her. And he told um, told her all the things that she ever did and still loved her. So when we worship God in spirit and truth, we don't focus on what people say or think about us. She had this holy boldness to go into the city and to tell people of Jesus and the love that he showed her because that transformed her. Her focus was no longer on who she was, but on who God is who Jesus was, her saviour. And then verse 39 says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So here we see, despite her reputation, that people took this invitation that she was giving out to them. And they came out and they met Jesus. And I just want to bring this home a little bit. And maybe for us here, we think about our past. And maybe there are some things that have caused us to be ashamed. But Jesus is the one who can transform our lives. When people see how Jesus impacts us and has changed our lives, they cannot help but become curious about him. So I want to encourage you to not be afraid to share your story. Don't be scared to speak of your mistakes. Because just as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, that the grace of God is sufficient for you, for his strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I'll just read this little um, point that I wanted to make. God can turn your test into a testimony, your mess into a message, and your misery into a ministry. So true worship, it changes us so that we go out and we can boldly proclaim Jesus to, the, to people around us through the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So my last point uh, this morning about true worship is that worship is missional. And that starts with God seeking us because he's actively seeking his lost children. And in verse um, 24, it says, was it 24? Um, um, Sorry, I'm not sure it's not the right verse. Um, But it says there, God is um, seeking. And in verse 4, sorry, it says um, that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Even though he could have... um, yeah, went around it. And this is because Jesus was listening to the Spirit speaking to him. There were people in Samaria that he needed to speak to, that he needed to bring the gospel to. And he goes to Samaria to seek out this woman individually. And just as he seeks out that woman, he seeks us individually as well. He doesn't just seek us, but then he sends us out to seek too. And when you think about worship, um, it's not just about receiving. Yes, part of it is about receiving. We do Bible study, we come to church. But we're not just nourished by what we receive, but also what we give to God. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about when you eat food, um, you eat it so that you can be nourished. But how can you be nourished if you give your food away? And this didn't really make sense, but it kind of makes uh, sense in the spiritual realm. 
So we can actually be nourished by giving spiritual food to those around us. So I want to read the rest of this story and how Jesus makes this point. So when he met the woman at the well, he comes, uh, the disciples, they come back, they come back with food because they know Jesus hasn't eaten um, that whole time. And it's the heat of the day, he must be starving. So they come and they're urging Jesus to eat the food that they brought him. But then he says this in verse 34. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So here Jesus is, is saying that he was spiritually nourished by doing the will of God and by helping to bring his work of salvation to this woman. And now he's sending us so that we um, can be spiritually nourished by reaping the harvest before us. And in verse 35, the second part, he says, Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And I just want to read a quote from um, Ellen White, because she comments on this story from Desire of Ages. And she says that every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. So to have a practical faith in Christ, it means to seek out those who are ready to receive him. And that requires us to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and to put on our spiritual eyesight so that we can see the harvest before us. And I want to ask you this morning, are you listening to what the Spirit is prompting you to do? And he may be sending you somewhere outside of your comfort zone. And this is just as Jesus went through Samaria, instead of going around it, and that was the easier option, and it was the more comfortable option, but he went to Samaria. He went outside his comfort zone. Maybe he is sending you to someone who is living a questionable life just like the Samaritan woman. And he's calling you to sit with them at their well, to hear their story without judgment and without condemnation. Maybe you are the person divinely appointed to point this person from their empty water pot to the living water that shall never run dry. The story of the woman at the well it shows us what true worship is all about. Worship is not limited to what we do on Sabbath, but worship covers every aspect of our lives. And once the love of Jesus fills us from the inside out, we cannot help but be transformed into his likeness and become a fountain of blessing to the world around us. I wanna invite um, the music team as we sing our last song. And I want to leave you with this challenge this morning. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave everything to us. And he did that in the hope that we would give everything back to him. And I want you to think about your life this morning and to allow God to search your heart. Is there anything that you are holding on to? that is holding you back from worshiping God in spirit and in truth. He's calling you to give your whole self to him. And that includes your brokenness, that includes the burdens that hold you down, that includes the sin that you are ashamed of. Jesus says that he can take it. You cannot weary him, you cannot burden him. Is Jesus knocking on the door of your heart this morning? All you need is for you to let him in. And he is calling us to come, to come to the altar. His, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling us to true worship. He's calling us to surrender our whole selves to him 
so that we can be filled afresh with his spirit. And I pray that this will be our prayer for all of us this morning as we sing our last song, O Come to the Altar. <laughs>